Andrew! <laughs> Come here, boy. Andrew! Come here. Look at the camera, boy. Hey, Andrew! What you got for daddy? Andrew was born on the 1st of December 1986 in Washington, D.C. to an African-American father who was a retired Air Force sergeant. And in the latter part of his life played professional chess to make money. Following similar footsteps to his dad, Andrew Tate became Indiana State chess champion. Beating a 16-year-old for the title, he proved to himself he was becoming a master in the game of chess just like his dad. My father used to beat me at chess from the other room. I'd have the board, he'd be cooking dinner. I'd say E4, C5, Knight F3, Knight C6, and he'd just read it out while cooking dinner and smoke. As a child, he loved chess, learning many lessons from it. With the right strategy, you could always win. But what was about to happen next would change Andrew Tate's life forever. Before he and his siblings knew it, they were over 3,000 miles away from their father after their parents decided to divorce. I lost my chess coach because my father stayed in America. Mm -hmm. So I lost my chess coach and I decided to um, do something that's similar. And to me, chess is war, kickboxing is war. It's one-on-one, -on -one. there's no luck. There's no team that's there to help you or save you. His father, father, at, home, at, kilos, his father at home, Emery Tate, will be absolutely jumping around the room. Congratulations, I know he's a massive fan of his, of his son. The chess master himself, Emery Tate. Your winner, fighting out of the red corner, yeah. Andrew Cobra. In the middle of all of his success, Andrew Tate was about to receive the most dreadful news of his entire life. On October 17, 2015, Emery Tate Sr. died after suffering a heart attack during a chess tournament. In his last few years on earth, he lived and breathed chess. He died a hero, doing what he loved and left a legacy in the world of chess. So I owed some money to some dangerous people. We won't tell that story, but I needed money fast. And uh, I had 70 grand, I needed 100 to stay alive. He began to write down his assets and liabilities. So I had these five girlfriends in these five different cities all around the world. So I thought, well, are the girls an asset? Well, they have beauty, beauty's valuable. So I guess they're an asset. And it just so happened as he was browsing the web that he noticed an ad at the corner of a website that said, talk to live girls now. There's some chick sitting there talking to dudes, bring money, bring money. So that was the plan. I was like, all right, cool. The girls are gonna be webcam girls. And it just grew and grew and grew. And it got to the point where at one point I had 75 women working for me in four locations. Damn. And I was doing $600,000 a month. He decided to get out of England due to the legal system. Can I ask, why do you choose to live there? In Romania? Yeah, I know you, I know you have like businesses and things going on there, but, but why there? If corruption exists, which it does, let us all play. Why do only they get to play and I don't get to play? So you live in England and they're gonna come around and spout law and order at you all day long, but the elites, they ignore all law and order. I was commentating for a, a cage fighting show in Romania called RXF. Which is the Romanian UFC equivalent. He noticed that one of the event sponsors was a casino brand. This casino brand was owned by three brothers and rumored to be making over $18 million a day. Mm -hmm. And I went up to the owner who was the sponsor, he was on the VIP table, said, excuse me, that I want to talk some business with you, blah, blah, blah. I spoke to him, I said, look, I want to open some casinos. He said, well, why? Do I need to open a casino with you? He provided no value to them. This set Tate on a journey because he knew with the right strategy, you could always win. How can I get this guy to let me franchise his casinos? And eventually I came up with the following battle plan, which he agreed to. His idea was to open a location right next to their biggest competitor. He would completely pay for the location and give them a percentage of his turnover. Even if it doesn't make any money, you're getting paid off the turnover and it's just gonna take, it's gonna take some money from your competitor. I'm taking all the risk on this, right? Wow. And he agreed. He said, okay, let's do it. Start to make a bunch of money. Life had never been so good, but all of this was about to change. The World Health Organization has officially called it COVID-19. You must stay at home. People are thrown into chaos. The world is shutting down along with Romania. The casinos are currently closed in, the, in, in Romania, so I've been dealing with that. And as that's happening, Andrew Tate was about to change the world forever. Andrew Tate owes a lot of his success to the established and growing Red Pill community. Before I explain why, we have to understand what the Red Pill community actually is. Focus on 
becoming better, getting in the gym, exercising. It's better to do it when you're young, eating healthy. One day your looks are going to be gone. You're going to get no attention from men. No men are lining up to date 50 year olds. If you want a man, you're going to have to change your attitude, lose some weight, become more feminine. You're average looking at best. And now you're asking for a man who's in the top 10% of men. You don't qualify for one. It's also known as the Manosphere. Its central tenant is a metaphor borrowed from the film The Matrix. If you take the red pill, you'll be awakened to the true reality of women and also society's values and traditional masculinity which are being eroded by the media machine which is pushing radical feminism, political correctness and a disdain for all things masculinity. But if you take the blue pill, you'll be ignorant to all of this and thus complicit. Can, can we agree on this following statement? Some people are more physically attractive than others. No, I think that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Okay, so you think you're a 10? Yeah, don't I think th I'm gorgeous, I think I'm perfect. Listen, don't take this the wrong way. You're not Please a 10. Please lay it on me. You're, you're not a 10. Okay, that's just your opinion I'm, I'm not gonna rate you, but you're not a 10. Okay. The Manosphere, from my own opinion, is a combination of basic self-help for men, some objective realities about the modern dating landscape from a man's perspective, and at the same time, some very extreme views. Women get in line when they know you have other women in line. And when you move a certain way, when you deal with women, where you treat them as an expendable commodity, because two things can be true at the same time. You need to tell people they're stupid. Like yeah. this is the problem no. with women. See, here's the difference stupid. between men and women. When men are wrong, there's serious consequences. When women are wrong, it doesn't matter because you're just the guy's just trying to. F the same person can teach things that could benefit men and even women, and at the same time teach other things that are detrimental to men in their relationships with women. There's a silent majority that understands that the family is the backbone to any thriving civilization. A few of the things presented in these spaces would benefit some women, but because of how these things are packaged, they automatically alienate the majority of women. Body shaming, it's up, oh my God. But if a nigga's broke, nobody has no problem telling him, yo, you're a fucking bum. Well, why are you guys money shaming me? But, but you control how much you weigh, you control every morsel of food that goes into your mouth. So because of this, the majority of consumers of red pill content are men, so the manosphere ends up becoming this self-serving ecosystem of men saying things to other men that they already know and agree with. The irony is that some hardcore red pill fans think that they've escaped the matrix, but in reality, they've just managed to join another one. Now, Fresh and Fit have managed to establish themselves unofficially as the gatekeepers of the red pill community, and many red pill influencers have appeared on the podcast since it started including Andrew Tate. I don't think most women can actually genuinely understand how lonely the majority of men are. As part of his master strategy, being associated with key figures in the red pill community has given Andrew Tate access to millions of men. I say that life as a man is exceptionally difficult. I say the most beautiful and the most terrifying thing about being a man is you're born without value. Society doesn't care about you. You're only going to be cared about based on how useful you are. When I talk about the Matrix, I'm talking about the systems which have been created by society, which are deliberately designed to enslave. The Matrix is trying to control your mind. They're very good at it. Andrew Tate has managed to tap into the deepest desires of most men. The desire for money and resources. The male perspective on relationships. Men's fear about tyrannical authority that wants to take away their freedom. I've read enough history books to know that the people who do the censoring are never the good guys. And they've been censoring a lot of arguments for a very long time in the name of good. This explains why many men are die-hard Andrew Tate fans. He's become this Christ-like figure who gives a voice to men and validates some of their fears and desires. It's the same reason we support sports teams and other professional athletes. If they win, we win. When they lose, we also lose. One of the things that has contributed to his internet fame was the way in which he delivers information. I'll give the game away to the entire YouTube world why I've destroyed absolutely everybody in any debate ever. I say things that they know are true and that they agree with, but I say it in a way that angers them emotionally and they get caught up in their brain because they're saying, he's saying the truth, but I'm pissed off by how he's saying it. So I want to argue with him, but he's right. So instead of saying, men are physically stronger than women. I'll say females are weak. 
you end up having a whole group of people sitting there trying to argue. Well, some women are strong like men, trying to argue the fact that women are as strong as men physically because I've emotionally controlled them all yeah. and upset them all. Andrew Tate is good at delivering statements of truth in such a way that causes division and arouses anger. It's the perfect viral strategy because you engage those that understand the message you're trying to convey and also get the attention of those the message is meant to trigger. So triggering women is not a mistake. It is a feature of the gospel of Andrew Tate. You have a good network, you have good information, you have some kind of liquid money, mm. you have the ability to survive without that money, you can take a risk. Although some of what Tate says is useful to many men, when you closely analyze it, there is nothing necessarily new or unique or revolutionary about his message. Definitely the way that he says things is worth paying attention to. So emotions are feedback, but stoicism is the ability to process. If you take away his ideas and what he preaches and judge him purely by the way that he lives his life, at least by what he portrays online, there's nothing about the way that he lives his life that is different from any other celebrity or rapper. Here in my garage, just bought this uh, new Lamborghini here. He also had an online platform called Hustlers University. It has various courses on things like stock trading, e-commerce, copywriting, and aims to teach men to make money and help them to break out of the matrix. These things in and of themselves are not bad. A lot of people actually make a living from these things. But from what we know, this is not how Andrew Tate became a multimillionaire. Instead of building a community from scratch, what Andrew Tate would do would prove his genius. And Andrew Tate's quest of becoming a grandmaster in the game of life. He's managed to form what appears to be strategic alliances in very key spaces. And the criteria for these groups is large enclosed groups, mostly made out of men, groups that are underrepresented in the mainstream Western media. I wanted to ask you now, because this is the hot topic, especially in the Muslim community, about your conversion. Tate plugged himself with established communities of men. He found the leaders of these groups and aligned himself with them. The question is, what is Andrew Tate really up to? Regarding Andrew Tate, I think multiple things can be true at the same time. He can have some very helpful takes for men, many of which I actually agree with myself, but at the same time can have other takes that are detrimental to men and their relationships with women. He also has a very questionable past. And the biggest question is, what game is Andrew Tate playing? And in the end, who is actually being used?